I met, I met Ms. Fowler in July of 2002 when I first was hired here. Um, it was kind of an interesting um, experience because um, I was told about her that I had a, a very senior teacher here. If I were to sum up Mrs. Fowler with a single word, it would be compassion. And I think that's the driving force behind her longevity. I mean, she, she's not only the uh, oldest teacher in New York State, she's also the second longest employed teacher. Uh, she has grandchildren of original students. Roxbury is a warm community. It's nestled in the Catskills. The population is made up of people whose ancestors have lived here for generations. Roxbury is like I've died and gone to heaven. Roxbury is a, a unique community where people are caring, people know each other. This is a uh, community that was traditionally a farming community, um, but there's been an incursion of, of new people coming in. It's a large second home population, uh, a lot of summer and uh, ski homes in this community as well. The families that attend here and the children of those families are um, salt of the earth type families. Um, certainly many of them are, uh, many of the parents are professionals. We also have uh, blue collar workers, skilled workers among the parents, um, hard working people, people who care about family and values. It's a family here. Uh, Roxbury Central School is a family. A lot of us, uh, you know, like I have two of my own children. I handed my own daughter a high school diploma last year. A lot of us are related to our, our students, if not, they're our neighbors. Um, it's a very kind of intimate school, school atmosphere and school setting. Uh, very stable faculty. Um, we don't have a lot of turnover here. People, people come and they, and they make it a career. Roxbury School is around 350 children. Um, our district covers nearly 200 square miles. So the heart of our community is the school district. This is a K-12 school. Our largest grade right now is fourth grade. There are 44 kids. And our smallest grade right now is actually third grade, which is 19. So it's kind of a challenge sometimes because you have to deal with these large bubbles of kids and then small bubbles of kids that come through. I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't know Mrs. Fowler or recognize her car or her figure uh, walking down the street. She is that well known in the community. I met Mrs. Fowler when I moved here actually because uh, she was the fifth grade teacher and I was in fifth grade, even though I wasn't in her group. As far as was it odd working with her, a little bit, uh, because she's was my, could have been my teacher, even though she wasn't. She was there when I was in fifth grade, so it was, it was kind of strange. When I first met Mrs. Fowler, uh, she stopped by the office when I was hired here and welcomed me in her own gentle, kind way. I was astonished that Mrs. Fowler wasn't a volunteer in the building, but a full-time faculty member. Astonished because she had obviously been doing um, what she loved for a very long time. It was a surprise to find out that there was a teacher here, at the time 87 years old, still teaching in the system. And then to meet her, I discovered the reasons why. She plans to be an educator as long as she can be useful and supportive and helpful to students. Through and through, she absolutely loves teaching and loves kids. Her enthusiasm is something that you do not always see in this business or any business. Teaching is a very stressful position. It's, it's, it's a stressful situation at best. Uh, and working with Dora, is, as I have, she's very even-tempered. Very caring about other people, uh, very considerate about their feelings and making sure that when she's working, she does the very best job she possibly can. I grew up in a small town near Oneonta, a small town called Wells Bridge, and I grew up on a farm. My father and mother purchased the farm 
In fact, my father would not marry my mother until he had $1,000, so he would be sure to support her. And that was a long time ago, and $1,000 was a lot of money. And they had a farm and doing fine, and then he contacted a cancer. Three weeks before my father died of cancer, my grandmother that they were living with also died of a stroke. And so it was very difficult for my mother. They uh, came from very humble beginnings. It, it was a struggle growing up, uh, you know, financially. But uh, they got through it as a family, and I think that uh, really did um, instill a lot of uh, of uh, her values that uh, still remain with her today. My mother worked very hard, had to work hard, and she earned very little money for what she did, doing housework and cooking for people and sewing for people uh, because she didn't have an education. She had planned to be a nurse, <clears throat> but she, got, she started her education, but then she got married, so she, she wasn't trained to be anything of the um, doing house menial work, really. We, we respected her tremendously. I mean, you just, we were, we didn't do things to offend her because we knew how hard she worked. The fact that my mother had to work hard and the fact that she was widowed had, has helped me face the things that I had to face in my life. The, the things I remember when I was smaller in the world at that time uh, it was a very prejudiced situation. I lived in this small community, and um, I was Protestant, and we were very prejudiced against Catholics, and I thought Catholics were terrible, <laughs> which I've certainly learned different since. And, and also, a Ku Klux Klan was getting, just getting started then, and my uncles were, and my mother were a member of the Ku Klux Klan, and, it, and as a small child, I remember them dressing up in those costumes that they wore, and they sincerely, completely believed in what they were doing. You know, it was such a prejudicial time, but there were wonderful times, too. They used to have parties at houses in those times, and uh, they had dances, square dances. And I'm so glad I'm so old that I can, can remember things. Children, people have no idea about it today. Things like an ice house. We, they used to cut ice and uh, for the, to keep the milk during the, in the summertime. And they had an ice house. And I was not a very cooperative child, and I would get angry often. And I would go up, i climb up the, into the ice house and sit on the, the, the sawdust to keep cool. And people wouldn't know where I was because I was, you know, I had been bad, which was often. And uh, I went up there, it was my hiding place. And I remember that so well. I'm so glad that I have that in my memory. She's always very, even at that young age, I'm told, was always very spirited and uh, headstrong and had her own mind. She was <laughs> really a character. She was naughty quite a lot of the time. She really was willful. She was. You see, we had very little contact with other children. We lived on the farm, and we walked to school, and other children walked to school, too. And so my brother, my brother, my sister, and I more or less made our own entertainment. I went to college for, it was an insurance policy for me. I was going steady with my husband. But I went to college because I felt I had something, if something happened to him, I would have an education. And that's the sole reason I went to college. And I went to the state university, which was a normal school then, uh, because it was the cheapest place I could go. And uh, I worked for my room and board. I loved to read books. I just craved reading and I read and so that uh, I wanted to be a librarian. But I could not afford to go to college to be a librarian. And the, the cheapest place I could go was a normal school, and that's why I went there. And it was a, the right thing to do, but I didn't. At that time, I was, felt that I, I had to get an education. I had a drive within me, 
And I really have a lot of faith in God, and I think God wanted me to be a teacher all the time. I had graduated a three-year <coughs> course, and um, then I worked in the tuberculosis, ho tuberculosis hospital. Then I got married, and I did not work. And I did not work for five years. And then my husband died, and I had no choice. It's so ironic. When my, after my husband and I had been married, the same number of years that my mother and father had been married, my husband was the age that my father was when he died, and I was the age of my mother. And I had two children, and only different, she had three. So I went back to college uh, to get refresher courses and, and um, applied for a job. And at that time, after about five or six years, they couldn't find teachers. So I was very fortunate. I had no intention of getting married again, no intention at all. And the phone rang and this man asked me if I would go out with him. And he, he mentioned the name of a girl that I knew, that I trusted, and I think if anybody had asked me to go out with them, I would have. I was so tired. And I said, I, there are three of me. There's only not one. There are three. And he said, that was all right. And so we went to the movies that night. And uh, from then on, I just enjoyed him a lot. And I got to the point that I was falling in love with him. And so I decided to tell him. We were on our way to church. And I decided to tell him that I am not going to get him more involved that I'm not going out with you anymore because I'm not ever going to remarry. And my daughter was in kindergarten at that, age, that time. And she sat there and I glanced down and his big hand was over her little hand. And I thought to myself, you cannot be that selfish. You have to think of your children. And so from then on, I let myself fall in love with him and get married. And he was a wonderful father to my children. My teaching career has been that I taught fifth grade. Um, I'm not sure the number of years, but it was a good number of years. And I had earned my master's degree in college, a master's degree to teach English. And I had several hours in teaching science. I certainly think I probably was in my 50s when I was still teaching fifth grade. And that's when the principal said to me that he wanted to move me up to junior high and to uh, in high school English. A few years ago, um, they asked me to work in AIS, which is helping special needs students. And then the last two years, they've, they've put me in uh, working in language arts in the grades again. So I'm back to fifth grade where I started. My sister's seen many things happen during her years of teaching unusual things and bad things. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. I remember when President Kennedy died. I remember the crying. I remember uh, <clears throat> the students crying, the teachers crying, and uh, the school. It was just a, a tragedy for all of us. and it, he, it was just like we really knew him. He was very real to us, and, and uh, he, was, he, he was very real to me. I, I felt like I knew him. It was just a blanket it went over the classroom. It was announced to the, over, the, over the loudspeaker that that had happened. We didn't go to school. We didn't have to go to school. We stayed home and watched it. We did have huge televisions. We stayed home and watched it on them. Duck and cover. We had drills, air raid drills, and we were, we, and at that time people were building bomb shelters for themselves, and we were conscious very much of the fact that there was a war, and we, um, learned a lot about it in school, and we practiced in the hall things we had to do if uh, there was an attack on our school. It, it was strange. 
it was so far away. You see, it wasn't right next door to them. It, it wasn't like it is today that something happens and you almost hear immediately. A second plane also hijacked. I'm a renegade as far as doing things differently. When, and sometimes that has not always made me too popular with other teachers, but I've got results. In my first years here, she went to the middle school level and was teaching English language arts, English. Not only was she teaching English, but she was teaching old time grammar. Old time grammar, sentence structure, and what is called in the business Latin entomology, which is root words. And so children are learning the meanings of words that they haven't even been exposed to yet with Mrs. Fowler. I do not feel lecturing is the best message. I very often would tell, especially when I taught high school, I'm going to talk to you five minutes or maybe ten minutes, I promise, and then there'd be activities that they would be involved with. I, I just don't believe that they're going to listen that much to lectures. I taught in the grades for years before I started teaching high school. And uh, homework, for example, I let them tell them I wanted to work a certain number of minutes or hours, maybe an hour. And then they'd write me a note and tell me what they did. <clears throat> and they had a choice of what they wanted to do. And oftentimes they do more than I required of them. Oh, I know. I'm, I'm best known for the fact that I take them over to Kirkside Park for, to, to write. I know I'm, I'm known for that. We selected and each child had their own area and wrote about that area. And therefore, I was getting my language arts in there, too. And we raised money to go camping, so I was getting a lot of math in there. So I think my style of teaching was more that I was trying to use the things they were used to and that I felt they were really going to need. I feel each student and I guess all teachers do. I look at them as individuals with individual needs. If I know a child is struggling and doing the very best they can, I'm a little easier with their grading than I am with a student that it comes very easy for. On the other hand, I like to challenge the ones who can do better to do better. So I maybe am a little hard on them. I'm not terribly proud of this. But the junior high students are very nervous, especially when you go from sixth grade to junior high. It's a big step, and you're nervous about your grades, and you're trying real hard, and, and uh, especially if you're a mediocre student. And so I used to stand up on a chair and throw the report cards all over the room. They had to find their report cards. I do not feel it's right to have to teach for the test. On the other hand, if you do not teach for the test, they're not going to pass the test. And I think that this has curbed a lot of real education. And having taught as long as I have, I know it's a phase that will pass. The standards are fine, but I think uh, we need to have much more flexibility uh, to allow teachers to be teachers and to allow students to uh, take full advantage of, uh, of, of their uh, learning experience, rather than just worrying about uh, those state tests and how that's going to ultimately look in the newspaper when the reports come out in terms of how well a particular school or class did in terms of, uh, of their performance on these uh, state tests. A test and, and always being told you've got to get ready for the next class, I think that's wrong. I think you should, uh, teachers should help students get the very most they can at the level at which they are. I think she's instilled a lot of other uh, benefits um, in these students as well. Working hard, that sense of uh, setting a goal and achieving it, all, all those things that are what I call lifelong lessons that to go way beyond uh, the state tests and way beyond just the academic uh, subject matter. You can't really enjoy something if you know, if you're told all the time there's something harder ahead of you. And I've always firmly believed if students survive high school, they're going to enjoy college. The biggest change in education, I believe, is the lack of respect 
that children have for education. They, and I think partly it's because of the, the computer age and they can get all the information they want there and so why bother and they get an education because they want to earn money but I don't think they have respect for education that they had at one time. When I started teaching uh, it was possible if you wished to slap a child you could slap them. It was all right and if they misbehaved and they went down to the principal they would be disciplined physically. But of course you can't do that today. But I think I've never really had problems with discipline. Mrs. Fowler is grandmotherly. And being grandmotherly, the children give her a great deal more respect in the classroom. And it's, it's a charm to go into her room and see children who may have been a little wound up earlier in the day, calm, considerate, and working hard on their work solely because it's Mrs. Fowler who is there teaching them. I never physically felt I wanted to discipline a child, but my age is a big help as far as has been for years because people like their grandmothers and but they don't care for their parents, some of them, but they like grandmothers. It's difficult for a young teacher to start teaching now. The respect is not there. Teaching tools have definitely changed. When I started teaching, they had old-fashioned mimeograph machines, and uh, there wasn't even, you didn't even use typewriters a lot then. You, did, you printed more of your own work, then, then, then typewriters, and then gradually they got these other machines. There were, of course, there were anything like computers or anything like that, the t teaching tools. You, you manufactured your own things. Dress code for me has not changed. I feel teachers should dress as, as teachers. I, I do not go along with the way many teachers feel about it. I don't feel that you should try to be a student. I feel that you should you gain more respect if you dress as, as well as you can so they can look up to you. I would be shocked if I saw Mrs. Fowler arrive at school in pants. I have never seen her anything uh, but a uh, you know, very nice dress and heels. I tell you what happened to me a few years ago. I was working with a student and everybody, the other, the other girls were wearing slacks. So one day I wore slacks. He was furious with me. And he said to me, and he, this is a high school uh, junior high boy. He said, how would you like it if I wore a dress? <laughs> and I didn't wear slacks ever again after that to school. I, I'm sure kids can't stand the thought they're going to have an old teacher, not a young, pretty teacher, you know. But after about a month, I think they don't realize I'm old. I, I grew up, I grew up in, a, in a family that taught me uh, to respect my elders, uh, that we need to learn from our elders. Uh, one of the things that um, I've been very interested in my life is uh, the study, the study of World War II, because I'm, I'm a history major originally, and uh, you know, we're we're going to lose the, the the World War II vets. We're going to lose the veteran teachers. Uh, regardless of age, people in general are able to help each other with our own areas of expertise. I guess it, the only thing that bothers me is that people, when you get old, people expect you to be old. You know what I'm trying to say? They expect you to be old. They hear your age, they expect you to be old. And they, they have certain preceded ideas about how old people are. And there are a lot more people like I am than not, I think. I, I just don't exactly know how to say it is to feel you've outlived your students. Um, how I've outlived my colleagues. I'm not sure why I outlived anybody, except that I just believe God has a plan for me. And, and uh, I, I miss them. I miss the people. But I thoroughly enjoy the life I am living with the people that I'm living with. My son lives in Maine. My daughter lives in Tennessee. It's hard for them to know their mother lives 
at 88 that she's living by herself in a small community away from a city where there's facilities to help you. And my son in particular felt that I should quit. My son was a teacher and he has already retired, but he's given up and he's, he's fine for mother to teach as long as she wants to. I, I know every uh, summer uh, as it gets toward fall, uh, I'll ask her now, Andor, are you, are you going back to school this year? And uh, she'd say, she always tells me, well, you know, I'm feeling good. I f still feel like I make an impact uh, with the students. And so, yes, I'm going to go back. And I think that's great. I am not surprised that Dora Fowler hasn't retired. And I am not surprised that she continues to return to Roxbury. I will be surprised when she decides to stop because her goal is to keep helping children and there are countless numbers of students that that she's helped um, over the years and she's still helpful in the classroom and um, still has that passion and that commitment. I am enjoying life very much. I have nothing to retire to because I like what I'm doing. I think Dora was able to retire when I started here 29 years ago, originally back in the summer of 1979 when I interviewed for this job. It didn't occur to me that I was, would be replacing Dora, I just knew it was an elementary position. Uh, but it turned out that they had decided they would wanted Dora to do junior high. So I started in 1979, 29 years ago, in effect replacing Dora. And here it is 29 years later and she's still going strong. And, I'm looking to retire in a year. I think I'm going to be a little embarrassed if I teach after 90, but I wouldn't be surprised at what I would. I don't think Dora's at all crazy. I think it's what's best for her and what's right for her. Not me or maybe not other people, but for her it's the right thing to do. She amazes me and she has a place in the school until she comes to me and says no more. I think what we've learned from Mrs. Fowler is to continue to work and stay in the workforce as long as you're a contributing member of society. She's contributing uh, at a very high level of proficiency and she should continue to give back to the communities. She doesn't need to give advice. It's her example by doing that's really so important. She's um, so committed, so passionate. I, I hope that I'm fortunate enough to be that committed at the end of my career in teaching uh, as she is. As a principal, I get bogged down by a lot of the, what, 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 what we like to coin in the profession, administrivia. You know, I spend a lot of time signing things and go, doing paperwork and everything else like that. And one of the things that Dora has done for me, and, and I think she's done for everybody, and I think it's infectious with her, is that she has been able to um, teach people that kids are the most important thing in this business. I don't think it's changed. And then when I taught high school, it was the same way. I cared about them, and they knew that. And even, even um, I might have a very difficult student. In fact, I think one of the most difficult students I ever taught is a good friend of mine now. I, I was in the grocery, I was, came to the grocery store, I think two weeks ago, and this man's voice was, Mrs. Fowler, Mrs. Fowler. And it was this student that when I had him, was very, very difficult, but I think he knew that I cared about him. And um, there have been very few students that by June I haven't felt friendly with and they haven't felt friendly with me. One of the stories I like to pass on is that I've been superintendent here for three graduating classes. Invariably, children graduating in those classes, one, sometimes two, have felt compelled enough to come to me and say, I would not have graduated if it wasn't for Mrs. Fowler. A few years ago, Dora Fowler received a bouquet of flowers. And of course, she has many admirers. We weren't surprised by that. But she came in so pleased because it was actually a bouquet of flowers from a student who had recently graduated against all odds, a student who had struggled through his tenure at the school. and she was able to help him pass tests and help him graduate and it was a thank you bouquet and I'm sure one of uh, many that she's received over the years. I think that keeps her going because it's absolutely true I'm sure because I I hear um, stories like that 
And when they find out who I am, that I'm a nephew of, of Dora Fowler, uh, the stories will come. It almost makes me want to cry. And uh, it does, because I know in my heart that somebody else could have done it, and I'm glad the Lord let me do it. Her continuing to stay into the system and not be concerned about her age, which she shouldn't be. She's still performing her job very, very well. Others at her age would have left. There's no reason for her to leave. She's still giving to the system. She's still giving to children. I, I, cannot, I cannot fathom the idea or the thought of, of um, working, working in public education for 57 years. And now she's coming on to her 58th. Um, I, I just can't, I can't fathom it. And, and her, her enthusiasm and her endurance is just uh, mind-boggling in it. It reminds us me and it keeps me recharged, Ab absolutely keeps me recharged. You, you may not believe this, but I don't feel like a celebrity. I don't feel important. I don't feel proud. I, I don't feel any, anything. Isn't that, it's incredible. I should feel something, but I don't. I feel I have a story to tell. I want to reach people. But uh, I just don't feel anything special. I'm not special. I don't feel special. I, I don't feel unusual. I just feel that there's so many, many others are, that are just as good. She's an inspiration. She's not a person that's here, uh, you know, working as a CEO or working in a Fortune 500 company. She's a, she's a humble woman that loves kids, that keeps on teaching, and it's something that should be inspiring to uh, our materialistic society because she's an exception. I'm probably one of the few really happy people around because I'm just satisfied with what I've got and I'm looking for, not looking for anything more. Teaching was certainly Mrs. Fowler's calling, uh, without question. This is her life, one of, part of it anyway a big part of it. She will leave a legacy of, of endurance and, 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 and integrity uh, um, and, and a fond love for learning and there will be uh, a place that will be created somewhere in the halls of the school as long as I'm here that will recognize her very publicly in perpetuity. Uh, and I think she'll always be remembered as uh, uh, someone who was a great teacher and uh, someone that when you think back uh, uh, on your life and your, all your teachers, I think she'll stand out as one that certainly was outstanding. And I expect up in heaven there will be some poor little kid who needs help. So Roxbury as a community and as a school will continue as long after Mrs. Fowler retires. Um, however, we will miss her. Anybody that can dress to the nines and wear, wear high heels every day to work um, like her for 58 years, um, who, who has a big smile on her face every time you see her, is going to be missed. Can't imagine life without her. When Dora Fowler leaves Roxbury Central School, the school will be so sad to see her go um, because she is such a positive role model to not only students but also to staff and so many people have been affected by her. If you make a difference in someone's life, it's a marvelous feeling. It is just an incredible feeling. To, to go to graduation and see people stand up there graduate and you know that you had a part in their graduating, it's a wonderful feeling. Or, or to go to a, I went to a church baccalaureate service after in this great big tall, senior, his friends all around him. He left the friends and came over and gave me a hug. Those are the things that make life worth living.